Hey folks, welcome to the AABIP podcast. This is Samir Avasarala from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm your host for this episode. Thank you all for joining us today. It'll be a terrific discussion about some tools that are becoming more commonplace, the single-use bronchoscope. Today, we're very fortunate to have Jaspal Singh join us. Jaspal is the medical director of pulmonary oncology at Atrium Health and the Levine Cancer Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome, Jaspal. Thank you very much, Samir. Thank you for having me. Do you have any relevant conflict of interest to disclose? Yes, I do occasionally consult for AMBU. All right. As a reminder, the views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker in mind and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. With the formalities done, let's get started. So the main topic today, single-use or disposable bronchoscopes are now widely available. They can be used in the ICUs and the bronchoscopy suite, but should we be using them more often? Just Paul, what is the current landscape for single-use bronchoscopes? Well, I think it's a great question. So, Samir, I think there's a broader question is what is a single use for the single use every scope essentially is any orifice you might imagine. That whole market is exploding dramatically. And um, it's something that I don't think I really realized how much was happening in this space until I started looking into it a couple of years ago. And I think the pandemic obviously forced us to look at look at this much more carefully. It's been going on for a while. And so this market of bronchoscopy in a single use bronchoscope actually it's incredibly large. Um, we see it in the ICUs, we see it in the ORs, we see it in other places. And I think is in, in pulmonary, in bronchoscopy, in the bronchoscopy world or pleuroscopy world, we're not, we're not used to see, we, we sort of have a, you know, a way of doing things traditionally with reusable scopes. And I don't, I don't think we've, we've given this enough of a fair shake. Mm -hmm. Seems like based on my review of what's out there, there's several options to choose from. Have you incorporated these devices at your shop? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, I well, so it started out with, um, I think most ICUs, and once the pandemic hit full force, I think all of us were moving towards single use bronchoscopes. I don't know anybody who's really using reusable scopes now in the ICU for non advanced bronchoscopy stuff. Um, pretty much they're becoming the, 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 um, tools of choice, essentially, for a lot of our surgical colleagues, our, our bedside intensivists, uh, for example. And why is that? Well, they're easy to get, they're easy to set up, they're easy to maintain, they're easy to, obviously, there's no cleaning, uh, they're single use. Um, and the respiratory therapy teams love it, because it's a lot less taxing on them to set that up. And so from that perspective, um, we've seen just an explosion of our, of our, our location using it from emergency room to the operating rooms to um and, and all kinds of other spaces now in the bronchoscopy suite we haven't really used them a ton and i know this is where the pulmonary community is you know, that's probably where you're, you're trying to go is where where is this going in the bronx suite mm -hmm. or in the wherever you wherever you do your cases and I, I don't think we know yet um i think many of us are you know accustomed to certain things we have certain ways of maneuvering but I think we should keep our minds open because I think there's a lot of potential here. So currently right now at your shop, you're using the, the AMBU or the GlideScope offering or, or a mix of both? We use it. We use them both. And obviously the other ones, Olympus or Viren, I mean, Olympus bought out Viren. So they have a, a whole armamentarium of single use scopes. And now Boston Scientific's getting into the space. And I think there'll be other partner, other, other parties coming into the space now with really impressive next generation single use bronchoscopes actually that have the, some of the features and some enhanced features that even the reusable scopes do, scopes do not have currently. So I think, most of us would agree that the current reusable bronchoscopes that we have perform fairly well. They, they get the job done in an efficient way. And we've been familiar with these devices um, for long times now. Why make the switch to the single use? I think you have to step back a little bit and say, you know, look at what the, not so much the scope, but what problem you're trying to solve. And this is how I, at least I'm approaching it right now is if at the problem I'm solving it and the location and the urgency by which I need to solve it. And I'll give some examples. Um, just like last month, I'm in the emergency room with a patient with a foreign body obstruction. And getting the, getting the reusable scope was a pain. And it turns out, you know, I thought it'd be a very difficult uh, extraction. 
Um, and so I had the respiratory therapist set up, set up the reusable scope. They're not familiar with the tools that we do in the bronchoscopy suite. This is the mm-hmm. weekend, of course. It doesn't happen Monday through Friday during working hours, uh, you know, scheduled. And so this patient's an extremis. And so how do I remove a foreign body with a reusable scope? And it turns out it works just fine. You know, if you have the right size scope. Well, the therapist at the bedside didn't know which size to get. They, they got me the wrong size first. Then they got me the, then another therapist ran and got the bronc cart, uh, the b- larger bronc cart, but didn't have any of the adapters involved, none of the tools in there. And so it ends up being where um, if I was to do an emergent case in the emergency room, I probably just want to have a, a small stockpile where, sto- where space is tight of reusable scopes, for example, uh, for emergencies. In the operating room, I kid you not, I had a patient with another sort of patient I need to go do an emergency, emergent bronchoscopy on a weekend. And uh, and so I, you know, one of those things you finally come home after call, you <laughs> go back in the hospital because like, you're on a Sunday evening. And, uh, and I called the OR, I said, I need this and this. And I get there, I'm like, where's my bronchoscope? And they're like, here it is. And I saw hanging was a long colonoscope, a <laughs> large, <laughs> large, long one. And it just, it goes to show you that, um, and the point isn't to make fun of my teams. The point is just that it happens to all of us, right? And then you have to constantly retrain people, constantly think through what you need to solve. And honestly, for this case, I probably, this is just simply a dilation of a tracheal stenosis. I probably could have gotten by with just a, you know, a, a regular <laughs> a, a, a therapeutic uh, a bronchoscope where, through which a, a balloon dilator can go down. Nothing really fancy is needed here. So I do I really need to make the operating room staff go up and down, chase their chase their tails to find all the equipment that I need for my bronc cart to work correctly. And yes, they probably should know how to do that. But in reality, I don't have the bandwidth and the time to manage that, that solve that problem. Now, in my own bronc suite, um, I think all of us have seen um, uh, some challenges in maintaining staffing and consistency. I don't think that's a unique problem to where mm-hmm. I work. I think it's everywhere. And so you start thinking about, okay, it's not just about me, but about my team. What does my team need? How do I need to make sure to make it easier for them so that no matter who's there, they can set up, they can clean up, they can manage all the issues, they know where the instruments are, and they can they can assist when best able. Just because I should be focused on the procedure and, the, and looking forward at the patient. And so how can I make my team, my environment easier to manage? And we start thinking about those aspects, especially as bron- bronchoscopies evolve. Now we have, you know, advanced tool, advanced bronchoscopes, different types, some with ultrasound incorporated. And then now obviously with the newer technologies like navigation and um, robotics and such, the armamentarium and the amount of knowledge and skill sets has expanded. So what can I do? What problems can I solve that are easily solvable and do, do things like single-use bronchoscopes, for example, or a smaller smaller array of tools and things like that? I got to start thinking about, I really can expect cannot expect everyone in that room to be an expert. And so from that perspective, I look back and I think, okay, are there cases where single-use bronchoscopes may be quite helpful? And they probably are. So in summary, it sounds like and I think we can all agree about this, that single-use bronchoscopes keeps things simple and run things more efficiently when you need to do bronchoscopies that are probably outside of the setting um, of a bronchoscopy suite or, or an operating room. Absolutely. Um, and even in the bronch suite, I would argue there are sometimes, so, and not every, so obviously if you visit 10 bronch suites, you visited 10 bronch suites. Not everyone's the same right? Everyone's different style, different setups, different sizes, um, different, you know, different ways the patients are positioned, the, where the if you have anesthesia, where the anesthesia machines are, where the mon- extra monitors are. And because of space and functional limitations of every room, I've yet to see one, I mean, there's probably a couple of rooms out there that just are just ginormous, non tons of space. But Sometimes you still find yourself with all the equipment that we have, the, the navigation software or the, or the towers or the various aspects, um, you find yourself kind of clumsy. And so here's where I, I really think single-use bronchoscopes may be helpful. If you find yourself, you know, having to do a complex robotic case or a mm-hmm. complex case where you have several tools, several monitors looking around and the patient's limited and where, and where they can be positioned and such, and your space is tight you might want to think, okay, how can I make this easier for me and my staff and my team? And so you start thinking, so single-use bronchoscopes do come to mind, even in the Bronx, even in a high-performance, high-performing Bronx suite. So for the reasons that we do bronchoscopy for within an ICU, do you think all ICUs should switch to using single-use bronchoscopes? 
I think all ICUs should really consider them. Um, whether it makes sense on the business perspective, I can't speak for each of them. Um, I will tell you that the cleaning aspects of, bronco- of bronchoscopes, endoscopes, and such, it's becoming much more complicated. It's becoming complicated from reagents. It's becoming complicated from technical requirements, and especially from uh, from regulate, re- regulatory forces. Those those aspects of cleaning are tightening down quite a bit. And I don't think I ever realized until I looked into this topic more carefully as to how much contamination risks there really are. And when you start thinking about the patients we take care of in the ICUs and all the difficult infections and such, you start to really question, am I really doing the right practice by expecting someone somewhere in this hospital to clean and care for my scope as much as possible. And we've all seen that, like, you know, you have your training programs, you have, there's those cycles that we all go through where, um, you know, scopes get damaged, they get, they, they, they don't get cleaned effectively, they don't get quite the care that we would take for ourselves. And that's just normal. That's just normal wear and tear. And that wear and tear might be more dramatic than we probably anticipate. And so, I, I would argue that actually, especially if you're not using a ton of them, and then there's certain procedures um, in, in the ICUs like percutaneous tracheostomy, where you know as as skilled as you are, there's always going to be some point at which you know that needle punctures and potentially damages your scope, or you're pulling something, yanking something, and just it doesn't doesn't quite move, and you you cro- you cause some type of stress, either shear stress or damage to the to the camera or some or to the image. Something doesn't go quite right, and that's just inevitable. Um, and so, um, I think it's just something that you got to think about. Like for per trachs, I don't think I would ever argue to use a use a a regular scope unless you could really unless you could justify to me that it needed to be done. Sure. If I was a man administrator, for example. I think one thing that we sometimes lose track of is the, the current bronchoscopes that we use, the reusable ones, are, are very fragile devices. And as you mentioned earlier, a lot of intricacies go into taking care of them and cleaning them. There's the whole spalding classification about critical devices and semi-critical devices. A very interesting topic overall. So we talked about single-use bronchoscopes in the ICU. It sounds like there's not a lot of great reasons to stick with using reusable ones in that settings. Um, can I interrupt I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Samir. I would say the one thing people have been critical about, and I'm sorry about this, about interrupting. The one thing they've been a little bit critical of people in the ICU have been about, is about the lack of strong suction, the lack of some maneuverability that some of them have, and they didn't feel had the comfort and the grip that we're all used to. And mm-hmm. especially in an emergency, you want that, right? Well, I would say that I would encourage, and I've encouraged my own my own uh, colleagues in, in critical care, whether it be medical or surgical or other like neurocritical care. I've told them all of them. I said, just stay tuned. The newer generation that you're seeing out there now, the, what you you ex- experience in the first part of the pandemic is very different than what's coming out now in the next in the next couple of years. And then it's from all the manufacturers you mentioned, Ambu, Glidoscope, Boston Scientific. I mean, I mean. And Olympus Viren. I mean, the newer scopes and the and the innovation here is incredible. And I think you're going to see a dramatic shift in experience of all these. We uh, certainly look forward to those new toys coming out. So with the IC, we talked about the bronchoscopy suite, um, the OR, whichever setting you do, advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy, and also therapeutic bronchoscopy. We talked about that as well. So are the current generation of single-use bronchoscopes compatible with any of the adapters we would be using for non-robotic ENM or fluoroscopic navigation? Yeah. So, I mean, so a lot of these, um, I think you probably already know that, you know, with with Olympus acquiring Viren, obviously that provides a strategic advantage for those who have, who use Olympus scopes, for example, the idea to make the monitors compatible, to make some of the equipment compatible, um, at least from that perspective, is a very attractive option for some people. Um, some people just don't care. Like my ER doctors don't care. Like or like my GI colleagues and my ENT colleagues, they don't really care um, as much, um, depending on what they're looking at. Um, but that being said, um, I think we're going to see a plethora of potential options here. So if you have a reusable scope and you have a large working channel, mm-hmm. and now some of these um, some of these scopes actually have larger working channels than what we have for our typical therapeutic scope, um, which is a reusable scope. They have large, larger options here, like three millimeter working channels and such, and some, some even above. And so, can a can a navigational catheter fit down down there? Of course, the EWC or whatever whatever system you're using can fit down there. 
Absolutely. Can a radial probe fit down there? Of course. Right. Um, and so you start thinking through like, you know, if I have a case where, you know, I'm doing a case that's, you know, simply, I just need a single biopsy of a single lesion and, you know, and I don't know who's working with me. I'm not used to, they're not used to my equipment and such. And I just need to do it or I need to do it in a different location. I have really no hesitancy doing it. My own Bronx suite, I think I was just kind of used to a rhythm. And so we haven't really changed. We haven't really spent, we haven't really um, made that switch yet. But I could imagine a point where, you know what, um, the bronchoscopes aren't cleaned or someone's damaged or something that has happened. I could see myself easily pulling one out right now and just saying, hey, let's run to the ICU, get the scope. I just, all I need is this. Let's put the channel, let's put this down the working channel and we'll take care of it. Sure, absolutely. I'm going to switch gears just a bit here and talk about you know, financial perspective. A very important topic, uh, sometimes not the most interesting, but is there an estimate or a threshold number of bronchoscopies a month uh, at a center that would favor the use of a single use bronchoscope? You know, we try to look at this actually. That's a great question. And I can't say I know that for sure. Um, but I would say, you know, it's interesting around the country, the landscape is such that many, unfortunately, a lot of reusable bronchoscopes just sit in the closet, you know, and they don't get used very often. So at that point, what is the storage cost? So all the costs, the fixed costs and the variable costs from those fixed costs being, you know, acquiring the, the device to storing it, to maintaining it, maintaining the license, the license involved with it. Um, and then all those aspects and the variable cost as to how often you, you, you clean it, maintain it, warrant service it, all those, all those aspects. I don't, I can't say I know that well enough, but I, I would bet you if people are looking at sort of their, their inventory and asking themselves, do I really need to keep this big an in inventory? If I have a potential to flex my inventory with, 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 um, disposable scopes. So mm -hmm. rather than keeping an arm, a whole shelf of eight different sizes or five different sizes, whatever that, whatever that number is for your center, um, be like, Hey, maybe just keep a few different sizes scopes with a couple of backups. And then if I need any trouble, I can just simply order a bunch of, uh, um, uh, single use scopes if I need to, if I get into a pinch. And so you start thinking of it that way. And then I don't have to worry about licenses, extra licenses and warranties and other service contracts. And I don't have to worry about, you know, where these, where these are kept, my space is tight, all those aspects. And you start thinking about that a little bit. Um, and I think those questions need to be answered. And it's a great question. I just don't know the answer to it yet. Yeah, it says a lot to always know that you have some sort of emergency stock to, to use uh, when looking into a patient's airway. So uh, just Paul, my, my next question is for all the marbles. Which type of bronchoscope do you prefer in your hands? One of the single use types or a similarly sized traditional reusable bronchoscope? Yeah, obviously I'm so, I'm so, I mean, I'm older, Samir. I mean, I'm not that young. So for me, I was just used to the, used to my, um, my reusable scope. That's what I've trained with. That's what I learned with. That's mm -hmm. what I kind of grew up using. And so it's very comfortable, but that being said, if I'm going to remove a foreign body from somewhere or, you know, take out a, take out a, take out a foreign body in the Bronx, even the Bronx suite, like if I'm going to have to potentially cause, do a procedure that might risk um, damage to my, to my scopes, for example, uh, whether that be from tension, like removing a foreign body or like a valve an endobronca valve that just won't come out. We've all, I think we've all been there. Um, and then the other ones are being, you know, things like cryo, like I don't do cryo biopsy, but I'm trying to get a cryo, bi cryo probe forever. Um, but cryo biopsy, I mean, there's, there's been, it's not, it's no secret that that can really damage a, a reusable scope. And so I would be very comfortable using cryo biopsies and other things that are thermal, that, that can thermally damage the, sco the reusable scope and use a, use a, um, a, a single use scope in those settings. I have no problem with that. Any closing comments? I think the only thing I would say is let's keep our mind open. And I think it's one of those things where I, I find people are just like, oh, this is what I'm used to. This is what I, and I, I gotta say, having put my hands on some of these new generation scopes, I gotta say, I'm very impressed. In fact, um, one of the companies is potentially making a single use pluroscope. And so the pluroscope, the plural video scope that I use right now, I'd like, I've you know, done it for me for, for use it for years. And, and as many of us know, um, that brand is potentially is not going to be provided anymore, serviced anymore. So mm -hmm. then what do I go to? And, and to me, plural, uh, depending on how, many, how much proscopy you do or how much upkeep it is, it's a pain for my team to maintain it. But if I can just sort of get a, a single use, then I can do it in the operating room. I can do it in the Bronx suite, depending on what location I have, how much better that would be to have that. And so 
it's an easier sell to ask manufacturer to create a single use product than a reusable product, which is a lot less, which is, which is in a single use is much more likely to potentially be customizable or have additional features that you can look at and you can, you can, you can try it. And I got to say the new, the feel of some of the newer scopes coming out, the suction, the enhancements, the incredible flexibility. I mean, I do, I like my robotic bronchoscope, but I mean, sometimes it's, you know, it can be a while and you, you could, the, the case can take a little bit longer than you might, than you might otherwise. And mm-hmm. so, why, why wouldn't it be nice if I had a single lesion to go after just to, you know, break out a, break out a single use scope and go to, and if it's small enough with a wide enough um, working channel, can I, with the radio, can radio probe will fit down there. This will, I mean, and the tool, the biopsy tool will fit down. I could be done fairly quickly. And if I'm doing a case in the OR to help a surgeon, for example, or whatever the case might be, I got to start thinking about not so much the scope, but where do I want to practice? What settings, what cases and such? Where can I provide value to the patients and that hospital or facility or the team? And then think back and say, do single use scopes make sense here? Or do I need to sort of potentially think, and I think back to the stories, the horror stories, like, you know, going on, coming in for emergency and then not having the right scope available or not having their adapters available or not having it serviced or no one knows how where the parts are and all those things. And I mean, it's just, we've all had those horror stories with these complex machines. And so you're like, well, it can be simplified. And, and nowadays recorded and sent through meet records, media can be compatible with various aspects. Some of them, some of them have cloud-based data storage. I mean, you start thinking about the features that a lot of them are going to be incorporating. It's kind of exciting time. It's an exciting time to explore the space. I certainly agree with you. I think uh, these single-use scopes are, are here to stay, and they're just going to continue to permeate the practice of bronchoscopy. Uh, at our current shop, we use our single-use scopes in the ICU, and um, I do not miss pushing the, the bronch cart around to different parts of the hospital for airway examinations or assessment for hemoptysis. Just while that was great, I, I learned a lot today, and I'm sure our listeners did as well. Thank you for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a big honor. I'm a big fan of your podcast series. So thank you for that. We appreciate that. Thank you.